Funding for Impressions of California has been provided by the Joan Irvine Smith and Athlete R. Clark Foundation, Fieldstead and Company, the Fieldstone Foundation, the Arduous Foundation, and Friends of the Artists. century, when the landscape was a subject of passionate interest in American art, artists began to discover the scenic coast of Orange County, California. They explored the area from Dana Point in the south to Newport Bay in the north, but they gathered most often in the rustic seaside village of Laguna Beach, which soon developed into an important art colony. These early artists were attracted by the temperate climate, by the abundance of unspoiled natural beauty, and especially by the brilliant and exhilarating sunlight. Much has been remarked upon the quality of the light in Southern California. And so many of the artists talked about the challenge of capturing all the color that was revealed by this bright light. Author and curator Janet Blake notes that the brilliant light of the region tended to favor an impressionistic style of painting. The Los Angeles Times art critic Anthony Anderson remarked once that impressionist methods were the only methods that a landscape painter could use in Southern California, that this was the way to capture the light and color of our landscape. Many artists agreed with Anderson and Impressionism reigned as the dominant style in Southern California during the first quarter of the 20th century, with Laguna Beach becoming a major center of Impressionist activity. One of the first nationally prominent Impressionists active in Laguna was George Gardner Simons. He first painted the landscape of Southern California in the 1880s, and he built a studio in Laguna around 1903 Simons divided his time between the East and West Coasts, but he was best known nationally for his winter scenes depicting the Berkshire Mountains of New England. Gardner Simons was a close friend of another early artist, William Went, who became known as the Dean of Landscape Painters in Southern California. Prior to his arrival in Laguna Beach, Wendt had studied at the Chicago Art Institute, but to a large extent, his mature style evolved as a personal response to the California landscape. One of the things that is exposed by Wendt's paintings is, is his soul and his passion towards the local landscape. In the view of art historian Nancy Murray, Wendt's original and deeply felt response to the landscape gives his work a special character and power. I think the uh, thing that distinguishes William Wendt's work from the others is the, the strength and the structure and the fact that it grows out of nature rather than being a, say, a, a superficial style that's imposed upon nature. The casual and relaxed atmosphere of Laguna Beach was very much to Wendt's liking, as was the natural beauty he found in all directions. With Laguna as his base, he traveled throughout Southern California, painting a variety of landscape scenes, scenes like the one he describes so poignantly in a letter to a friend. The earth is young again, Wendt wrote. The peace, the harmony which pervades all gives a Sabbath-like air to the environment. One feels that he is on holy ground in nature's temple, here away from the soul-destroying hurly-burly of life, 
it feels that the world is beautiful, that God is good. Wendt's strong feelings for the California landscape led him to experiment with his style of painting. In time, he moved away from the small, impressionistic brushstrokes of his early landscapes to a bolder, broader, more expressive kind of brushwork that emphasizes the structure and geometry of the land. In his effort to capture the physical character of the landscape, William Wendt was working within the conventions of American Impressionism. In fact, this emphasis on solid form is one of the things that distinguishes American Impressionism from French Impressionism. And American Impressionism is distinctly different from French Impressionism. John Stern, the executive director of the Irvine Museum, explains that the French Impressionists, as seen in this painting by Claude Monet, were generally more concerned with creating optical and visual effects than with conveying a sense of three-dimensional physical reality. French paintings are characterized by having a dissolved form. That is a very important characteristic that is not to be seen in American paintings. So it's easy to tell a French Impressionist from an American Impressionist primarily is that the forms in the American painting have a lot of solidity. With the presence of major figures like William Wendt and Gardner Simons, the art colony at Laguna Beach attracted many other plein air painters. That is, artists who painted outdoors directly from nature. Frank Cuprian was a plein air painter who had studied in New York as well as in Munich and Paris. When he settled in Laguna in 1914, he immediately turned his attention to the sea, a subject which had long fascinated him. Cuprian became widely known for his luminous seascapes, which often feature delicate opalescent effects. Another early arrival was Anna Hills, a woman who was to become a prominent figure in Laguna's growing art community. Like most of the artists who settled there, she was well-educated and widely traveled. Her professional experience did not prepare her, however, for what she encountered in Southern California. And when she settled in Southern California, she remarked that it was quite a challenge to try and capture all the colors that she was seeing with the palette that she had been used to using. So she discarded all the brown tones and the gray tones and started using almost pure colors out of the tube in order to try and get all these various colors that she was seeing. She was a landscape painter, a landscape painter that practiced in plein air and possibly finished up her work in the studio. A lot of it, though, many of the pieces uh, finished in the plein air. Patricia Trenton is an art historian and curator who has done much research on the early artists of Southern California. The landscape work of Anna Hills, she observes, is richly varied, from paintings that display solid, rather chiseled forms reminiscent of William Wendt, to occasional forays into an airy and ethereal impressionism, as seen in this painting of the Laguna Coast. It is overall a very, very beautiful impressionist painting with the short, rapid brushwork that you see and um, the two figures, the meditative mood, the base of the tree. It was called a painting of reverie. While she was drawn to the landscape of Southern California, Anna Hills may also have been attracted by the greater freedom available to women artists in the West. With the looser social structure and an absence of rigid traditions and hierarchies, women were able to assume leadership roles in a variety of cultural organizations. For her part, Hills became a guiding force in the Laguna Beach Art Association. The Art Association also benefited from the leadership of another artist, Edgar Payne, a nationally recognized painter who settled in Laguna Beach in 1917. Payne's daughter, Evelyn Hatcher, recalls what Laguna was like in those days. It was a very, very small town. There was a two-room schoolhouse up on the hill where I started to school. And uh, it was just a very small, tiny fishing village, and everybody knew everybody. 
Edgar Payne painted the rocky coast at Laguna Beach, as well as the nearby mountains and canyons. In the summertime, Payne often headed for the high country of the Eastern Sierras. He would pack in to remote areas and establish a base camp, where he would then stay for several weeks at a time. For Payne, painting in the Sierras was as much a spiritual as an aesthetic experience. In his book, The Composition of Outdoor Painting, he uses the phrase window of the soul, by which he meant you see things that have spiritual meaning that talk to the soul. I think this is one of the reasons that William Went was important to him, because they both had such a strong feeling of the spiritual quality of nature. Payne was also strongly attracted to the American Southwest, both in terms of its indigenous cultures and its dramatic canyons and mesas. There, as in the Sierras, he was fascinated by the vast scale of the landscape. And in his paintings of places like Canyon de Chez, he often conveys that scale by placing diminutive figures in the midst of towering rock formations. I was struck by the way he used the composition to bring out a quality which in my study of art related to, especially to Chinese paintings, where the figures are very small and there is a great deal of empty space and nothingness. In 1922, Edgar Payne began a lengthy trip throughout Europe. He was particularly excited by the colorful fishing boats of France and Italy, and he painted them with great exuberance. Stimulated by the European art he saw all around him, Payne also began experimenting with a bolder, more gestural kind of brushwork, which can be seen in this painting of Mont Blanc in the Alps. When he returned to California, Payne put the new techniques to work, painting his much-loved Sierras with a broader, more powerful brushwork that accentuates the form and structure of the land. While Edgar Payne was busy elaborating his approach to landscape painting, the art colony at Laguna Beach continued to grow, attracting such painters as William Alexander Griffith, and George Brandreth. Another prominent artist, Joseph Kleitsch, settled in Laguna in 1920. Originally from Hungary, he had been working in Chicago, where he was well known for penetrating portraits and introspective figurative works, such as this painting, titled Problematicus. A good friend of Edgar Payne, Kleitsch was an extremely intense and restless man who was forever ready to strike out in new directions. Kleitsch was never satisfied. Kleitsch was always exploring new forms of art. Under the spell of the brilliant California light, Joseph Kleitsch responded vigorously to the local landscape. He abandoned the restrained tones of his earlier work and painted the village of Laguna in an explosion of color. His paintings all of a sudden become vivid. They become sort of uh, kaleidoscopes of color. His work just seems so passionate. The color is so strong and vivid, jewel-like. In Southern California, Joseph Kleitsch painted a wide variety of subjects, from landscapes and seascapes to profusely embellished and richly patterned genre scenes. Kleitsch also produced works that are strongly autobiographical in character, including a painting entitled Highlights, in which he lays out a sumptuous visual feast of objects that represent some of the great passions and pleasures of his life. Music, art, wine, and food. Not far from Laguna Beach lies the historic mission at San Juan Capistrano, with its picturesque Spanish colonial architecture and colorful gardens, the mission attracted the attention of many early plein air painters, including Joseph Kleitsch.
While many artists painted at Mission San Juan Capistrano, one artist, Charles Fries, actually lived there. Fries came to California from the East Coast, where he had gained a reputation as an illustrator and lithographer. Eager to experience the atmosphere of old California, he sought out the rustic village of San Juan Capistrano. Fries and his family lived in the mission for about six months in 1896. While there, he painted a number of landscapes, including this view of his young daughter at a nearby beach. In 1897, Fries settled permanently in San Diego, where he became one of the first resident artists to interpret the landscape of San Diego County. When Charles Fries arrived in San Diego in the 1890s, San Diego could be described perhaps best as a frontier American town. Martin Peterson is curator of American art at the San Diego Museum of Art. In the 1890s, he points out, San Diego had few cultural amenities to offer an artist. It did, however, have an abundance of unspoiled natural beauty. And perhaps, just as importantly, it offered a measure of artistic freedom unavailable in more settled parts of the country. Like many artists of Fries period, I feel they felt constrained by certain restrictions in the art and cultural scene in New York and the East and ventured westward. The greater artistic freedom available in the West was certainly an important inducement for Maurice Braun, who settled in San Diego in 1909 Born in Hungary, but raised in New York City, Braun had attended the National Academy of Design, and he had also studied with the leading American Impressionist, William Merritt Chase. Braun was determined to find his own authentic style of painting, however, and he believed he could do so more easily in the West, where there was less pressure to conform to prevailing artistic fashions. According to Braun's daughter, Charlotte Braun White, he may also have been drawn to San Diego by his interest in a spiritual movement known as Theosophy, because there was a major theosophical center at nearby Point Loma, part of which can still be seen today. He came to a place where he felt his own philosophy of life was being fulfilled and being renewed. And at the same time, he was just absolutely thrilled with what he found here in the way of, of color and form and, uh, and landscape. Maurice Braun responded strongly to the Southern California landscape. He roamed widely, painting a variety of subjects, from coastal scenes to views of the rugged backcountry east of San Diego. As an Impressionist painter, he became intensely interested in capturing the ever-changing light, as well as the subtle fleeting colors created by veils of atmospheric haze. Being a landscape painter, and especially in this period of, of history, the fascination would have been with the quality of the light. That must have been the one thing that brought artists and kept them here, was the phenomenal variety of this beautiful light. And when you're an Impressionist painter, you're painting the light. Braun's work is exceptional for its gentleness, balance, and harmony, qualities which reveal the artist's highly spiritual attitude toward nature. He felt that art must be more than the object. It must contain a certain a mystical, uh, ethereal quality which moves one, and this mood is one that is soothing, is quiet. He had a sense, the sense of peace and of wholeness, and he found great solace and apparently felt very relaxed with the concept that the world was basically a good place. I think it's possible that he felt that if he could capture it and communicate it, it would be helpful in people's lives. Braun had a significant impact on the fledgling art community in San Diego. He opened the city's first art academy in 1910, and he maintained regular contact with art centers on the East Coast, 
painting in such well-known art colonies as Old Lime and Silver Mine in Connecticut. Braun exhibited his work in major shows across the nation, received wide critical recognition, and also had ongoing representation in New York, principally at the Macbeth Gallery. It is through him that he sort of introduced an international character to the San Diego community. He put San Diego on the artistic map. If Maurice Braun helped raise San Diego's cultural profile, so too did a milestone event that occurred in 1915, the Panama, California Exposition. The huge fair in Balboa Park was organized to celebrate the completion of the Panama Canal and also to boost San Diego's aspirations to become a major commercial port on the Pacific Coast. The fair attracted the attention of several nationally prominent artists. They included Colin Campbell Cooper, an impressionist well known for his architectural subjects, and also Robert Henry, the famed New York painter and teacher, who, together with the San Diego artist Alice Clauber, organized a special exhibition of contemporary American art. Among the artists who won awards at the Panama, California Exposition was Alfred Mitchell, a painter who went on to become a highly influential member of the San Diego art community. Mitchell began his career studying with Maurice Braun, and his early work resembles that of his teacher. Mitchell shared Braun's love of the California landscape. He also had a similar spiritual attitude toward his work, which is remembered by his niece, Mary Mitchell Sadler, seen here as a girl in a drawing by her uncle. I think he felt it was a good world, and he wanted people to see that, that it was a good world. And I think the reason the public liked his paintings was it made them feel like it was a good world. He wasn't presenting social problems at all. He was presenting a beautiful world of nature. With Maurice Braun's encouragement, Alfred Mitchell went on to study at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia. While there, he was affected by the work of several well-known Pennsylvania artists, including Daniel Garber and Edward Redfield. A lot of my uncle's realistic painting looks a great deal like Edward Redfield, and he admired him very much. I have noted in the painting of my uncle's called Delaware Valley of great similarity to a painting of Edward Redfield's called Center Bridge, Pennsylvania. In fact, I think the two paintings may have been done at the same spot. When Alfred Mitchell returned to San Diego, he became a strong colorist, often depicting the Southern California landscape in a crisp, sharply defined manner, somewhat reminiscent of the Pennsylvania landscape painters. At the same time, his California paintings show wide stylistic variations, reflecting the multiple influences in his life as well as a growing tension in American art. He felt the tension between the conservatives and the modernists. A lot of his painting is realistic, but at the same time, some of it is impressionistic. And there were periods when he simplified things in a very much more modern style. But he never was a slave to any particular school of painting. As San Diego continued to develop economically and culturally in the early part of the 20th century, more artists were attracted to the area. One of the most original painters to settle there was Charles Rifle, who arrived in 1925. Rifle came from the East Coast, where he was highly regarded by critics and fellow artists, and where he had been a leader of the famed Silver Mine Art Colony in Connecticut. Rifle's work is distinctive for its animated lines and pulsating rhythms, as well as its somewhat strident color harmonies. It has been compared with the work of the Dutch artist Vincent van Gogh by Bram Dijkstra, a cultural historian at the University of California at San Diego. He was, in a sense, an American van Gogh. His works undulate always. There is a kind of a pulsation, a rhythm in his work that is quite striking. 
For example, in uh, Rifle's painting, a bit of silver mine in the old farmhouse, which he painted in 1916, there is a, a sense of, of the movement of the earth and the way the house, the old farmhouse itself, rides on the earth. During his years in Southern California, Charles Rifle brought the local landscape alive with his intense, kinetic, highly expressive style of painting. He was particularly attracted to the austere, sometimes forbidding beauty of the rugged backcountry east of San Diego, as well as the desert lands of the Southwest. It is the rugged area which he found inspirational and stimulating, and it's reflected in his art. The art itself seems to be alive. His paintings seem almost drawn expressions of the landscape, organic, constantly shifting. The artists who settled in Laguna Beach and San Diego during the first quarter of the 20th century came from many different parts of the country, and they brought with them a variety of artistic perspectives. Yet these men and women had one important thing in common. They were all greatly affected by the California landscape, and their work can be seen as an authentic and deeply felt response to it. Today, in an era marked by increasing concerns about the natural environment, artists like Maurice Braun, Charles Rifle, and William Wendt bear eloquent witness to the profound influence of nature in our lives. Through their work, they remind us of our deep and abiding relationship to the land.